So I don't know what it is, but there is something you see that I don't see. And let me explain, right? There's something you're good at. There's a skill you have. You're practiced at it. So you're going to see things that other people don't. I'll give you some examples. And I may not hit on everybody, but I'm going to try, okay? Uh, if you are an artist, uh, then you're going to see things in art and in pictures and in paintings that other people don't see. Um, and I don't need to give you examples. You'll see technique and you'll see all kinds of things that the average person doesn't notice. If you're a photographer, you'll see things in pictures, you know, lighting and angle and focus and all kinds of vocabulary I don't understand um, that the other people don't see. If you're a medical professional, that when you look at a human being, you're going to see things, signs, possible symptoms, possible issues that the rest of us don't see. If you are a law enforcement professional, that in a public space, you are going to see things and notice things the rest of us don't see. If you are a car person, then you're going to walk by my car and I promise you, you're going to see things that I don't see. Right? If you are somebody who is good at, at cooking, for example, uh, you're going to taste things and notice things that the rest of us don't. Now, why is that? Why is it that you, you can see things and notice things that other people don't? Well, there, the simple reason, as far as the examples I just gave you, is you're trained in that. That's something you have learned from experience or you have specifically been taught. You were probably practiced in it uh, to the point that you look for uh, those, those specific things. Now, hopefully I hit on most of you. And if I didn't, you know what it is that you see that, do, that other people uh, don't. Now, there's a couple of people in my life that drive me crazy and I love them. Uh, because they notice, they're just really good at fixing things, so they notice when things are broken, right? So uh, I might step over the same problem a hundred times or walk by the same flickering light or whatever it is, but there are certain individuals I'm super thankful for that will, and there, we have one, a couple in our church who will point out, hey, you know, you have a problem with such and such. I'll say, I have no idea. I didn't know because I didn't, I didn't see it. So my question for you this morning is, do you see Jesus? And uh, we're going to talk about that further in the message, so listen for the question. And another question I'm going to ask is, if you don't, or if there are times that you don't, or if there are people that don't, why not? Why don't they see Jesus, and should they expect to? Um. It's, it's interesting, Jesus said to us, before he ascended to heaven, he says disciples, and by extension to us, he said, I am with you even until the end of the age. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Is he, is he with us? Can we, can we see him? Uh, and, and what does that mean to, to see him? The Bible says that no one had seen, no one sees God face to face except for the one who comes from God. And that was Jesus speaking about himself. And he said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. In which case, you and I, if you were a literal thinker, you might think, that's awesome for the people who knew Jesus, right? They can finally see God because they see Jesus in front of them. But what about us? If we can't see Jesus physically, how do we see God? Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. No, no one comes to the Father except through me. And we're thinking, well, how do I do that if I can't see Jesus? So I'll ask you the same question. Do you see Jesus? And if not, why not? So uh, now that I've asked you those questions, let me set up where we're going. We are finally uh, near the end of of the Gospel of Luke, which I have been preaching for, through now for over two years, uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, in order, and we're nearing the end, and this is literally the last chapter of Luke, and here's what's happened so far. Jesus has died, right? We know what happens three days later, but they don't. So we're at the point in the story where Jesus' followers are scattered, scared, and confused. They don't really know what's happening. And so, uh, three days later on Sunday, first available opportunity, the women have gone to the tomb to finish preparations because they couldn't do it before because of the Sabbath, and they find the tomb empty. Um, angels appear to them and say, why do you look for the living among the dead? Which might, by the way, be part of the answer to our question. 
why you don't see something because you're looking in the wrong place. And they say, why do you uh, look for the living among the dead? He has risen just as he told you that he would. And so they go back and they tell the disciples and the disciples think the women are a little, come on, ladies, you know, you're a little grief stricken here. You're a little, mm, you have some issues. They think they're just talking nonsense. Um, Peter and John run and they look, right? But Peter uh, still struggles with it. He walks away wondering, well, what's going on? There's, there's not a complete understanding here of what's happening. And so that's where we pick up the story here in Luke chapter 24, verse 13. And so here it is. Verse 13. Now that same day, okay, so the same day, so this is Sunday, the same day that the women have said, we saw, we saw angels and they said Jesus has risen from the dead and people were confused. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. So they're they're walking a uh, one-day trip, seven miles. Of course, you know, that's a pretty good hike, right? I mean, it's, that's most of your day. Um, the two of them we're talking about are two disciples of Jesus. Now, these are not apostles. Uh, these are not the ones we call later apostles. A lot of times we think disciples, and we just think of the 12, but a disciple is any follower of Jesus. So there were lots of people who followed Jesus, and right now at this moment, they're confused, and so they're doing what you and I would be doing, which is they're talking about it. They're trying to figure it out. You know you do this. You know you would be doing this. And so there they are talking about what's going on, and they're on a long walk. Look at verse um, 14. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And then verse 15, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up. And walked along with them. Now this is kind of awesome. Because they're upset. They're, they're, we're going to see that more as we, as we go through the story. The, they're not having a happy conversation. They're having a stressed conversation. They're trying to figure out what in the world is going on. And all the things they've heard so far, they've not heard as good news. And at that moment, in their stress, in their confusion, in their difficulty, Jesus walks up. How cool is that, right? I mean, how awesome would it be the next time you and your spouse are sitting there wondering what in the world are you going to do about finances, and you're sitting at the kitchen table, and Jesus decides to come and pull up a chair and joins the conversation. How great would that be? If the next time you're standing there on the side of the road and your car is broken down and you're on the phone and you're trying to figure out what in the world to do with it, Jesus walks up and says, hey, what's going on? Imagine the next time you're, you're in the hospital bed or you're in the break room at work and you're, you're in one of those places and you're stressed, you're confused, you're not sure what in the world you're going to do, and Jesus just kind of saunters up. How great would that be? This happens to these two disciples, which a question I'm going to ask you is why? Right, so why did Jesus do this? Right, why, does, why in this way? I mean, we have various appearances of Christ, and there's various stories of him after he rose from the dead, but why did he choose to do this? Just two people who are... I mean, we have other appearances where he can, appears to whole crowds, or he appears to individuals, he appears to his, the ones who have become the apostles. He does these different things. But here we've got two people who are talking about their problems, and Jesus just walks up. Why does he choose to do it that? All right, verse 16, but they were kept from recognizing him. Well, that's interesting. So Jesus walks up, and because Luke is telling us the story, we know what's happening, they don't. It's kind of like when you're watching a movie, right? And, and you know because of something else the camera has shown you what's really going on, but the people in the story don't. They don't know this is Jesus, but we do, right? Now, here's what's interesting. Can you imagine that's you? Can you put yourself in the story? Can you put yourself as one of these two people that you're talking and you're stressed and you're worried and Jesus walks up and you don't, you don't recognize him? No. Why not? Why don't they recognize him? Is it, is it kind of like what's happened to you in the grocery store and someone walks up to you who you know, but you didn't recognize them at first because you didn't expect to see them in the grocery store? happens to children every time they see their teacher in the grocery store. 
Because we all know that teachers don't go grocery shopping, right? Teachers just live, they live in their classroom, right, to teach their children, and they're never anywhere else. And so for a child to see their teacher out in the real world is like, <gasps> right? Because you're not expecting that. So maybe someone got a haircut, it's been a few years, and you don't expect to see them there, and so you don't recognize them. So um, is it, could it be that it was in a different context? And maybe they weren't, well, here we go. Maybe they weren't expecting Jesus. Maybe that's why they didn't recognize him is because they weren't looking for him, nor did they expect him. One of the children here said maybe, maybe he looked different. He probably did look a little different, but elsewhere people recognize him. What, what is happening? What's interesting, the, the language that Luke uses, they were kept from recognizing him. They were kept by their own grief. They were kept by... Um, their own preoccupation. Maybe they didn't really look at him, right? I mean, you've done that. You've not really looked at someone when they came and spoke with you. Or maybe God kept them from recognizing him. Perhaps this was part of the plan. Perhaps they were supposed to have a conversation with Jesus because there was something they were supposed to see before they saw Jesus. Or to put it another way, there was something they were supposed to see and understand before they recognized Jesus. There's something else that's more important than them recognizing him. Let's proceed and see if that's right. Look at verse 17. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? So uh, there they are. They have, from their perspective, they have a stranger who says, so what are you talking about? Which I think is hilarious, right? I mean, I don't know how Jesus kept from smiling, but he knows exactly what they're talking about. It makes it even funnier as they're talking about him, right? You, have you ever had that really great moment when two people are talking about you and you sneak up on them? It's good, right? They're saying nice things about you in my, in my story, they stood still, their faces downcast, so apparently they stop, right? And they're sad. Now listen to the way, uh, way they answer him. I want you to hear this, but, but before we proceed, I want you to notice that they have sad faces, okay? Their faces are showing what's going on in their hearts and minds and how they're feeling, okay? The, this is important to understand the story. They are sad, okay? They are down in the dumps, and it's visible, all right, now let's see what happens. Verse 18, one of them named Cleopas asked him. So the, these two disciples are not the original 12. That We don't know who the other person is. Um, some theorize that it might be his, his wife, it might be another friend, but it's clearly another follower of Jesus. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days. Now, I love this story, and here's why. I mean, it literally is one of my favorites, and here's part of the reason why I love this story so much. Because this is so normal. This is like, you think you're different than the people from, who lived in Bible times? You're not. This is the kind of thing that you would say to somebody. Where have you been, buddy? Right? You have said this to people. Because some crazy thing was going on in the news or whatever, or something happening around and whatever, and somebody walks up and says, well, what's going on here? You're like, where have you been? Have you been hiding in a rock? We're all talking about this. Which is the other thing I love about this story, is the implication here is, we're all talking about it, right? And we have things like this in our life now. Some big event happens, and everybody in town is talking about it. Everybody. And that's what's going on here. Everybody in Jerusalem is talking about what's going on with Jesus. And the, and the word is spreading because it's interesting. It's different. It's crazy. Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem does not know the things that have happened there in these days? I mean, it's a little bit of an insult here. But what's wrong with you, buddy? Are you not paying attention? This is a big deal. We're all talking about it. In verse 19, what things, he asked. Now, obviously, Jesus knows right? Which, which I find just delicious from a story perspective, <laughs> because here he's saying, well, what are you talking about? And they answer, about Jesus of Nazareth, 
And they're saying that to the guy that it's about. I love that. Like, it's all about Jesus. Oh, really? Tell me about that. It's about him. Okay. What things? They asked about Jesus of Nazareth. They replied, he was a prophet. And I can picture Jesus going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. So they have good things to say about Jesus. They believe here that he's a prophet, that he is powerful in his teaching and in the miracles that he was performing before God and everybody. So this guy, Jesus guy, they're telling Jesus, was a really big deal. He was special. In verse 20, the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. And here's where we get to the sadness. Look at verse 21. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more is the third day since all this took place. We had hoped. But when Jesus died... Their hopes were dashed. Because when they were thinking redeem Israel, they were thinking that he would become their leader, that he would be a political leader, that he would rescue them and give them physical freedom, that he would rescue them from the Roman government, that he would finally, and picture some patriotism here, give Israel its rightful place so that we're not subjugated anymore. He's going to be our rescuer. He's going to be the hero that comes and saves us. But when he died, it obviously isn't going to happen. You know, can you imagine a superhero story? And I really like superhero stories, by the way. Um, can you imagine a superhero story where at the end the superhero dies and actually stays dead? And, and the bad guy wins? And some of you have seen a movie like that, right? But you know there's going to be a part two. Because <laughs> we don't want our stories to end that way. Why not? Why is it that there's, there's this longing in all of us to have a superhero that comes and rescues us, that even non-Christian people tell these stories and love these stories. Why is that? It's the third day since these things took place. They don't seem to remember that Jesus had said something was going to happen on the third day, and he had said it many times. All right, look as they continue to tell the story to Jesus about Jesus. Verse 22, in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. Now, they did not see Jesus, where they were looking for him, because they expected him to be dead and in the tomb, and he wasn't there. So they say to this Jesus, they don't recognize that they're seeing without seeing. They didn't see Jesus. And there he is, right in front of them. Because it didn't happen the way they expected. Their hopes were dashed when he died because it didn't happen the way they expected They didn't see Jesus because it didn't happen the way that they expected. And the way they retell the story, it's in sadness and their faces are downcast. And listen to all the stuff they just said. They didn't find his body. They said they saw a vision of angels who said he was alive. And the other companion went to the tomb and found as they had said, and they did not see Jesus. And rather than hearing this as hopeful, Like, he might actually be alive. I mean, you can understand them being confused at this point. Maybe we don't know for sure. But thinking, you know what? He might actually be back. Jesus might actually be alive. And so they could be retelling the story in a hopeful way, but they're not. They are totally seeing the glass here as half empty. Have you spoken to people who are in depression or difficulty or grief? And it doesn't matter how you retell the story. They only see the negatives. They only see the downside. That's all they're looking for. That's all they're seeing. And so this story 
that you and I would normally tell on Easter Sunday, the women went to the tomb and he wasn't there and the angel said, he has risen and we hear this story with joy. They hear the exact same story with sadness and depression and hopelessness because they're not looking. Verse 25, he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all of the prophets have spoken. What? Prophets. 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 What are you talking about? Prophets. Verse 26. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? You mean you didn't expect this? In verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Do you know what scriptures Luke is talking about here? He's not talking about what you and I call the New Testament. He's talking about what you and I call the Old Testament. Look at this verse. It's beautiful. He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures, what you and I see call the Old Testament concerning himself. I have heard people say, and I'm not picking on you because I know you've never done this, but I've heard people say, oh, the Old Testament is difficult. The Old Testament is boring. And, oh, man, I can't wait to get to the New Testament. And here we find out that the entire Old Testament is actually about Jesus. And so he spends time explaining how the whole Bible is actually about him. And I am not the only preacher who has said what I'm about to say. Man, I wish I'd heard that sermon. Whoa. If I'd heard that sermon, every sermon I preached after that would just be copying this one. He went through the Bible with these two people and showed them where he was in the Bible. And we can imagine the kinds of things he did. I mean, this would have been so amazing to be there as Jesus himself opens the scriptures and shows them what's really there and maybe shows them things they haven't seen before. He shows them himself so they can see Jesus in the Bible. So what did they see? What did he show them? Did he show them where Adam and Eve we're told by God that, this, that the serpent's head would be crushed and that the seed of the woman, who would be Jesus, was going to be bruised and that's why the Messiah had to, had to die? Did he, show them, did he show them Abraham who was told to sacrifice his son Isaac and then God said, no, don't do that. I'm going to provide the sacrifice and there's a ram in the thicket. And that Jesus is that lamb and that what Abraham was told to do, God actually did and gave us his only son. Is is that the story? Or maybe, maybe he told a story about Babel and about how the people were scattered all over the world and separated and spoke different languages. And will one day come together around speaking Jesus, and that would be the reverse of Babel, which happens in the book of Acts at Pentecost when people hear the gospel in their own language. Maybe he told the story of of Jacob dreaming and seeing a ladder and angels going up and down. And Jesus told one of his disciples in the beginning of the gospel of John, he said, one day you will see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And and so maybe he showed these disciples how how Jacob saw Jesus because Jesus is the ladder to heaven, that Jesus is the way. Perhaps he showed them how the Passover lamb and the Exodus and how the lamb's blood over the door, the unblemished lamb protected all that were within it and through death there was life and on and on and on. In fact, I challenge you, show me any story in the Bible And I'll show you Jesus, because he is all the way through it. And so here's here's my theory. Now, you check me, see see if you think I'm right. Why were they kept from recognizing him? Could it be so that their spiritual eyes would be opened first before their physical eyes? Could it be so that they learn to see Jesus in Scripture 
before they had this experience of seeing Jesus. If he had shown himself to them immediately, it's Jesus. Would they have listened to this incredible Bible lesson? Because you and I don't see Jesus physically, but you and I can see Jesus. And so was he sharing with them what you and I needed to know so that you and I could look in Scripture and see Jesus rather than being dependent on experience? And so my, my question for you now is, is, do you see Jesus? And how do you see him? Let me suggest some ways. One way for you to see Jesus is to start looking for him and to start expecting to see him. You're not going to see him if you don't expect to see him. And to start here where Jesus started, which is in the Bible, and to look for him in Scripture. Because if you don't see him in Scripture, I'm going to be really honest with you. It's because you're not reading it in the first place. And you're not looking for him. Where else can you see Jesus? Well, maybe you can see Jesus in, in God's plan for you, that, that what God has for you spiritually is more important than physically. One of the things that drives me crazy is, is the way that people misuse Jeremiah 29, 11. Have you heard that verse? I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. That is not a verse for graduating seniors. Meaning in America that you're going to go off to college and you're going to make lots of money and one day you're going to have 2.4 children and you're going to have a white picket fence and a, a wonderful dog and you're going to have a great job and everything's going to go well for you and God's plan for you is to prosper you. That's not what that verse means. Jeremiah tells the people that before they're about to go into 70 years of exile, which means the people who hear the verse aren't going to be the ones alive to hear the fulfillment of it. And the plans he's talking about to prosper them, not to harm them, do you know, want to know what those plans are? To bring the next generation back to Israel so they can wait for 400 years so that God can send Jesus to rescue them from their sins. That verse is actually about Jesus. God's plans to prosper you and not to harm you is the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus Christ that he came to die and rise again, that you might be forgiven of sins and reconciled to him. And even in the midst of hardship and difficulty, you have Jesus. That's where he is. In the middle of his hardship, he cares about your relationship with God more than other things. So, you know where else you can see Jesus? Do you remember that guy named Saul who's persecuting uh, Christians? And Jesus appears to him on the road and he says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Do you know why he said that? Because he identified himself with other Christians. If you're persecuting Christians, you're persecuting me. There's a reason why Paul, when he writes in the Bible various times, calls you and I the body of Christ. The Christians who have Jesus living in them and who are being made to look more and more like Jesus every day, you can see Jesus. He or she is sitting right next to you. And that moment of difficulty, when that person makes a phone call or walks up behind you and puts their arm around you or it maybe even says a silly joke, at that moment, it may be the Spirit of Christ in them that is encouraging you and helping you. And you just saw Jesus. He just didn't look like you expected. Because Jesus was in the body of a 73-year-old woman or a 4-year-old child. But the body of Christ is visible and here. And so we have before us another image of Jesus. Why did Jesus do that? Why at the Last Supper, when they were celebrating Passover, did he say, you know what, I want you to keep doing this, but I want it to be about me? Could it be because the Passover was about Jesus in the first place? Could it be so that you and I would have a physical reminder that we could see and, yes, touch? That what Jesus did for you is real? And just because 
uh, you can't see him physically doesn't mean it's not. And so this bread and this cup is not the actual body and blood of Christ, but it's a picture he has given us. And so when Jesus broke the bread, he said, this is my body which is given for you. And he passed around the cup and he said, this is my blood which is shed for you. And he gave us a picture so we can see the gospel. And so uh, I'm going to invite you at this time to join us. If you are a believer, if you know uh, Jesus is Savior, you're invited to join in this. I know sometimes people feel awkward and uncomfortable, and if you don't want to participate, you're not required to, and no one's going to look at you weird. All you need to do is pass the plate. So it's okay. So I need to invite our ushers to come forward. And what we're going to do today to make it a little bit faster is we are going to pass out the bread and the cup uh, at the same time if possible. And so we'll partake of both of those together. Will you please join me as we pray? Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for this picture that Jesus gave us. Lord, I thank you for the encouragement that you gave to those two disciples along the road. And Lord, I thank you for the reminder that you are with us. And so, Lord, we thank you for this, this bread and this cup, which reminds us of the body and blood of Christ. And so as we see a physical image, as we see and touch a, a very tiny piece of bread and uh, see and touch uh, a little bit of juice, Lord, may this be the reminder that we need this morning that encourages our hearts, our souls, our spirits, our minds, that through this this physical example that you have given us. Lord, may you touch the non-physical in us that we might rejoice. That, Like these disciples whose perspective is going to be changed rather than seeing the negatives, we will see you everywhere and that will change our perspective. And so Lord, use this experience. Use this visual experience physical experience to change what we see. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.